Yep, you can already think about the question, what has a chess player got to do with quantum computing? Because I'm going to ask you in a couple of minutes. But first, let me introduce the third topic to you. Our topic number three is quantum computing. And in July, I had the honor to uh, visit and take part at the presentation of the first commercial quantum computer in Europe of IBM in Stuttgart, or close to Stuttgart. And I personally think that this was already one big milestone and one step forward towards a European network um, in, within the sector of quantum computing. And yes, it is a key technology of the 21st century. But what makes it so special? What is quantum computing about? I mean, you all might know because you're tech entrepreneurs, most of you. Quantum computers promise to enable applications that are not feasible even with supercomputers today, such as complex simulation in the chemical and insurance industry. And because it is such a hot topic, obviously it is increasingly attracting engineers, new founders, young talents, and this is giving a big boost to the whole industry. And this is exactly why it is our third topic for today. So, as I said, I'm going to ask you the question now, and you can just shout at me whatever you think quantum, computer, quantum computing has got in common with chess players. What do you think? Chess players, quantum computing. Any guesses? You're quite sleepy today. What's up, everybody? We need to practice this later on once again. I mean, from my point of view, it's something with math, right? I mean, they both have to do a lot of calculations at once. And that's, I think, really special and powerful about them both. And that's exactly why we thought it's a really good idea to invite Germany's best chess player to kick off this topic today. Elizabeth Pates is a professional chess player and the first ranked woman in Germany. She was taught the game by her father, who was not only a chess grandmaster, but also belonged to the strongest players of the former GDR in German DDR. At the age of 14 years, she won the, German, the Women's German Chess Championship and became two years later only the top-ranked female player. And in 2018, she even belonged to the strongest players in the world. Off the board, she's really good in languages. She's a language enthusiast and is really fluent in English and Russian, even though she's a German. And I must say, I was quite anxious to meet her today because I think she's kind of an, well, a, a super talent, or something in between hyper-intelligent and master brain. And um, I'm only average in math, so I'm really excited to meet her today. Please give me a big round of applause for Elizabeth. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Elizabeth. I'm German's top female chess player. And honestly, today I'm talking to you about a topic which a couple of months ago I had single ideas or anything about. So I had to read myself a lot about this topic and to connect it somehow with chess. Now in the first picture, you see nothing else than a small introduction. We see the human's brain. And on the other hand, we see a kind of different wire cable slope. This is symbolizing the artificial intelligence. And before I get into the topic, um, here we have a picture of Kasparov and Vishwanathan Anand. Those players in the 19s were the leading players in the world. And Kasparov was playing a key role to the fact that artificial intelligence or that chess engines, that's how we call them, will be superior over the best chess player in the world. Back in the 90s, it was clearly led by Garry Kasparov. And we will later on hear about his match against Deep Blue. Um, Alan Turing is the key person to speak about the historical development of chess engine nowadays. In 1948, he was the one to develop the so-called paper machine, 
what was it about? It was nothing else than a kind of way to create a chess engine before any computers were actually developed on our planet. So in 48, he wrote the so-called paper machine, and he was the human CPU himself. In order to write a kind of logical system of algorithm, it is very important to know, of course, the different values of chess pieces and the different aspects which are actually helping you to evaluate a position. Of course, I know that most of you are probably not professional chess players or maybe just hobby players, so it will be kind of difficult for you to understand. But uh, what he was mainly concerned was the fact that it was very important to create an algorithm for the next followed up moves, which means when a piece is captured, that first of all, the recaptures had to be considered. Or when there are forced variations such as checks, then those variations had to be followed. And he wrote everything by himself, so he was nothing else than the human CPU. Now, actually, I will just show you some of the algorithm he was using, so it will be easier for you to understand. Here we see a kind of childish picture about all the pieces. So we see that the queen has a value of nine units, the rook has a value of five, the pawn is one, the knight is three, and the bishop is three. So that means, actually, like when you exchange pieces, it's obviously a bad trade to exchange the queen against the pawn because you would lose eight units. But alone to just Concentrate on the value of pieces is not enough, and the best story I can tell you about this is when you have a kid playing chess, and you as a parent, not knowing anything about chess, going into the playing hall, checking the position of your kid, and starting to calculate how many pieces are on each side, and then you would be very happy, enthusiastic, saying like, oh, my son has two pawns up, he's winning. A couple of, moves, a couple of minutes later, he would come out, and he would say, he would say like he lost. And why did he lose? Because in chess, it's not only important the material point of view, but also, for example, like if your king is safe or not. So that means if you're like a pawn up, or a piece up, or even a queen up, but you are mate, you're losing the game. So that's why it's important to have different kind of algorithm, not only based on the value of pieces, but also on king safety, on the mobility of your pieces, on space advantage, on pawn structures, on open files, a lot of different kind of algorithms you need to evaluate a position correctly. Now I show you two positions. And please don't even try to understand them. I'm not requesting this from you. But I want to show you the evaluation of both engines. So what? The first thing you need to know is, you see on the first picture, the evaluation of 7.63, which is basically like an advantage of almost eight pawns units. But if you, uh, if you count the pieces on the first position, you see that the pieces are actually equal. The knight and the bishop are both three units. The pawns like on both sides are four pawns each side. And OK, king and uh, rook and queen, so it's totally equal by material. So why the advantage is almost eight units? And that's very easy to explain, at least for chess players, but it will also be able for you to understand. When we look at the king of black, let me just try to uh, point it out. So we see the king. Now it doesn't work as I want to see it. It doesn't want now. I as, ah now I see it. Now we see the king, and next to the king is actually um, the the white's queen, and also the rook on g4. And basically, like by the queen and the rook, you see that the king is pretty much under attack. Also, the black's queen is pro is protecting the knight, but the problem is that there is a white's bishop which is also pointing on the pawn on d5. OK, the laser doesn't work the way I want to. But the fact is like that the evaluation of the engine is so huge because basically Black's king is close to mate. So this example will show you that material advantage is nothing worse and that all the parents who are like trying to count the pieces on each side 
should better not do it because I might be highly disappointed when the material advantage is not the outcome of the result they're expecting. The second position is a lot more difficult to understand because the evaluation of the second position is 0 0.72. But here, if you look at this position, we see that both white rooks have open files. So they are controlling already the D file and the H file. Besides that, we have a white pawn, which is in the territory of black's position. When we speak about territories, it means that the white position usually is owning the first to the fourth rank, that is the white territory, and the black territory is the eighth to the fifth rank. Now we have a pawn in the black territory, which is a pawn on e5. Let me try if it works now with the laser better, but somehow it doesn't the way I want. In any case, that pawn stands for some space advantage besides the two rooks controlling the open files would then give an evaluation of almost one point units, like 0 0.72. So you see with this two example, what actually I want to speak about is that the evaluation of the engine, it's always in value of pieces, is not depending on the material, but on all the other kind of aspects, like uh, open files, mobility of pieces, but mainly the safety of the king. That's why in the first position we see that the uh, evaluation is very high. And now to understand um, how to make the engines, or even Alan Turin was already indirectly doing it, and humans are doing it all the time, more efficient, what we do is basically like we don't calculate everything. So in the first um, picture, you see that all the kind of things are calculated. Now, of course, it's difficult because this uh, laser is not doing what I want it to do. Somehow it doesn't work the way I want. But let me explain it to you a little bit more easy. So we see a mini kind of board with one white bishop, and black has the knight, the bishop, and the rook. So if you, call, uh, if you count the units, we have five units. Sorry, we have three units. The bishop is three units against six units of both knight and bishop and five units of the rook. So for the, for the moment now, actually, like, um, plex advantage is eight units. If the white bishop captures now one of the pieces, he can pe capture the knight and the bishop, then, of course, you see in both pictures now that the evaluation changes. And you see on the right side that the evaluation is going down with only minus 50. And on the other side, you, go, you see it's going up to minus 80. This is just because of the fact that if you capture the knight, you can be recaptured. And if you capture the bishop, nobody can recapture. So this is a better variation. And now on the lower picture, you see that already like the second um, variation where you capture the knight, which is actually a bad move because you can be recaptured, is not included in the calculation of the engine as well as a human being because it's no use to calculate something when the other move is just a lot better. And that is called alpha beta pruning, and this improves the ability of the engine as well as the humans, because we only calculate this way. But this improves the ability of the engine to calculate better and more efficient. Now, actually, like Gary Kasparov, former world champion, best player in the world in the 90s, was the, old, was the first one to face the engine Deep Blue back in 1996. Here it's his second match in 1997. In 1996, he won the match with 3.5 to 2.5. One year later, he lost already 4 to 2. And actually, like you may say that this was the beginning of the end. This was the beginning of why actually like we all know that we don't have a chance against artificial intelligence. Back this time, he played against the brute force engine. Nowadays, OK, we already talk about network, uh, neural networks, but I get to this later. In any case, he lost in 1997, and it was already like a big crisis for our chess society because we understood it is going to be over or it's going to become the moment when we have absolutely zero chances. Some of the other very strong grandmasters were actually criticizing Kasparov for making too much experiments in this match, and therefore he lost it because he was a little bit too arrogant. But 
um, objectively speaking, it was already like um, the moment when it was clear that it's taking a couple of years later and it is over. Now, I can't click further. Now this doesn't work. But this is, ah, yeah. Here, actually, like, um, the problem about the engine development in chess is unfortunately um, very big because the topic of cheating suddenly played a role. And in 2006, it was Kramnik playing in his match against Topolov, and there was a so-called toilet scandal, which means that during the match, Kramnik always went to the toilet, and Topolov, who is sitting here in this picture, was assuming that Kramnik was cheating. And it was already back this time very easy because we had also the chess engines and softwares on our mobile phones. Also, what is interesting to know, Kramnik actually himself played in 2006 a match against a chess engine called um, Fritz. And in this match, actually, it was the final dot about the chances of human beings because in this match, actually, he had the advantage to know what the engine is going to consider. He had the advantage of, knowing, of getting all the material he needs about the, modern, the most modern theory, but yet he lost with all these kind of advantages, and that actually, like in 2006, officially we speak about um, the moment when we don't stand a chance against um, chess engines anymore. Here we have um, Mr. Regan. And Regan was developing a method to check on cheating, which means he was using the games of a player and calculating the statistic of his moves and comparing it to engine moves. And when the statistic was showing that the person was overperforming, it was an indication of cheating. Of course, in a single game, you can always like overperform. It can happen. But usually, it was tested on a couple of games, at least 10 or something. And you could assume that if someone is overperforming, he is cheating. And with the help of this method, actually, nowadays, we are able to catch cheaters. <coughs> the match Kayak and Carlson, actually, there was huge rumors that in this a uh, moment of the match, neural networks such as AlphaGo, who was developed in 2016, were used already to prepare Sergei Kayakin, the Russian player on the left, in his match against Magnus Carlsen. Those rumors were false. However, still in um, this particular match, since Sergei Kayakin is from the Crimea, so he was a very important figure for Vladimir Putin, he had the greatest support ever facing the uh, strongest player in the world, Magnus Carlsen. He lost by a very small margin at the end, but this was a moment when actually neural networks entered, oops, entered our planet. So here we have AlphaGo and AlphaZero. And the difference is very similar to explain. <clears throat> in 2016, AlphaGo was developed, and compared to chess, this was the first neural network which was able to beat the Go World Champion. Chess uh, was already like beaten by put, uh, by put force engines, but as for Go, it was 2016, the moment when actually it was over. One year later, Alpha Zero was developed. And Alpha Zero is also a neural network. And now, of course, the main question is, what is the difference between put force and neural network? For us in chess, this question is not relevant because we already don't stand a chance against brute, brute force engines. But uh, for the general public, it's quite interesting how differently they work. So the brute force engines are handcrafted by humans, which means a lot of very strong chess players are feeding the program with all knowledge you need to know, what you already heard, like value of pieces, um, mobility of pieces, king safety, and so on. So it was feeded by at least 4,000 different information, the brute force engine. The Alpha Zero, the neural networks, was not feeded or handcrafted by humans at all. What this neural network does is nothing else than to play millions over millions games against each other and taking its own conclusion. So by playing each other in like millions and billions of games, 
He requires all the knowledge he needs to know about chess, about chess to become unbeatable. The fun fact is actually that the brute force engines are at least 1,000 times faster in calculation over the neural network. But here comes the huge difference. But the neural network, they have 50, 25 million of different information whereas the brute force has only an information source of 4,000. So we speak of 10,000 times more information for the neural network um, devices. And that actually means that the information they are collecting by playing against himself for like billions of games is something a human being, no matter how many strong grandmasters you put together, are able to perform. And that is what Alpha Zero makes so incredibly strong. And it's impossible to understand how they are doing it, because they are doing it by themselves. They are taking their own conclusions by playing billion over billion games against himself. So, and the last question is, it's probably the most disappointing answer you will actually hear. Solving chess by quantum computing. Actually, a couple of days ago, I was asking this question to one of the biggest chess programmers of our biggest company in Hamburg, Chessbase. And he said it's absolutely irrelevant if quantum computing can solve chess or not. Because we speak of a game with 32 pieces on the board. And you have to understand that after each move, each move done by white or black, you have at least 30 legal moves. So we speak about 10 to the power of 40 different kind of positions. So this number, 10 to the power of 40, is galactically big, which is not imaginable. So basically, it means if quantum computing is able to solve chess, it's not important to answer this, because the biggest problem is we are not able to save this information, because we have to save 10 to the power of 40 different positions. And this is a number which is not securable or like savable on our planet. And that's why the question of quantum computing and chess solving is for us not irrelevant. Uh, is for us not relevant because the problem is the data saving. And yes, that was basically already it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Please give us a big round of applause. <laughs> Thank you very much, Elizabeth. You can take a seat already. I'm actually going to sit down with you. Has anyone from the audience already got a question? Now you've got the chance. I'm, I can only say it again. I don't hand over the microphone quite often to the audience, but now you've got the chance to ask your personal questions. If anyone wants to just uh, stretch your hand. If not, I'm actually going to start. And you can think about it a, a minute longer. OK, so Elizabeth, when I was um, told that you're coming today, I was straight away thinking about a series on Netflix. You might already know what I'm thinking about. Yes, The Queen's Gambit. Uh, yes, The Queen's Gambit, Damen Gambit. I don't know who of you has seen it on Netflix. Uh, yes, 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 few of you. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, I was a huge fan of it. I thought it's really cool. But is your life actually like? The ones of, she's also called Elizabeth, by the way. Yes, That's she, really she's funny. <laughs> uh, you've got the same name, at least. But is your life similar to hers in the, in the series? Actually, like, um, well, I will put it in a mild way. The Queen's Gambit is actually not about chess. OK. It is about a woman in the society of in inequal inequality between man and the woman. And it's covered by the topic of chess, because chess stands for intelligence. Chess is a very rich historical cultural game. But objectively, this series is not about chess. And what we are facing in this series are a lot of moments when she's playing in tournaments. But these moments they are showing on TV, they have to be shown in a dramatic way to keep it interesting for the audience to watch it. But if we would cover chess as it is in tournaments on the TV, I can tell you that everybody latest after five minutes will click away <laughs> because for 20 minutes you are sitting next to each other and you don't do nothing but thinking. Yes. So for 20 minutes, nothing will happen. And then, of course, you cannot uh, cover like a chess match in a t on, on TV yeah. where 20 minutes nothing happens. 
And it's not like that you're looking at each other and doing some comments. We are not allowed to talk during the game. In the series, actually, like there were not only like different kind of views or different kind of comments. It was more like a drama. And of yeah. course, it's the only chance to make it interesting. Yeah. But it's not nothing to do with reality. It sounds like you're not a big fan of, of the... Of no, the, the series games. was very good for chess. <laughs> I mean, it was really good for chess, but okay. I mean, nobody can actually tell us it has something to do with chess, but it was the best advertisement we could actually have because after yeah. the Queen's Gambit got on the market, it was booming and we got all a lot of requests from oh. TV shows, mm -hmm. from reporters, and we got a lot of interview requests because they wanted to understand more about it. But um, for example, like I don't know how much uh, deep into details you were looking when you uh, when you are watching this series. Do you remember actually the moment when she was playing a simultaneous in New York in a fast motion against three of her friends? Yes, in the in the basement, right? <clears throat> exactly. In this moment, actually, she wasn't playing herself. She was played uh, like a hand double played for her. Okay. Because like a non-chess player, like an actor, is not able to play three simultaneous, simultaneous games in such a speed. And all the positions they were using and all the games were from the historical database, which okay. means it was nothing invented. But they are not able to do that. So for this kind of scenarios where she had to play quick and a lot of games, they used hand doubles. Okay. But when she was playing against the world champion, she was making the move in such a kind of funny way where we understood, okay, I mean, no chess player would move like a piece and hit it on the field and push the clock yeah. like she did because this is not uh, authentic. Okay. And this actually like was probably for me at least and for many <laughs> chess players the most funniest part. <laughs> but that's really cool to listen to your perspective now, isn't it? Have you got any questions, guys? Still not. Co they are so impressed. They are speechless. Um, <laughs> I feel like uh, we've got the <coughs> microphone here. So if anyone's got a question, just um, reach out to us and Jana. Um, but then tell us what your life, what is your life actually about, or what does a usual day in your life look like if it's not like the Queen's Gambit? Well, actually, like before Corona came, of course, everything was very different. I mean, if you're a professional chess player, you're playing up to, let's say, 10 tournaments a year, which means you're almost every month traveling. traveling. So this is kind of normal. With Corona, of course, like we were all staying home for at least one year. So this was also kind of normal. And some of us in this time became chess teachers, just like me. I was suddenly oh. starting to coach. But uh, usually, like, you go to tournaments. Before the tournament, you have a training camp. If it's a very important event, you're preparing with a professional coach for this event. You prepare against your opponents. Then you go to the tournament, you play it. You come back home, you will be very tired. And then you have, like, usually, like, a couple of weeks. Sometimes you don't have much time, and you play the next event. Okay. Is your coach your father? He used to be my coach, like, up till the age of 16. And then actually I changed uh, to different kind of coaches and I also like went to a different school in a different city. That's why I had less contact to him. Okay, but that's because you were better than him by then or? No, actually like he was, uh, he got a lot weaker because of age, which is normal because like, no, well, it's, it's actually hard to understand in any other kind of sports, you would say, of course, like you are getting slower and running because you're getting older. But in chess, it's similar, just it's about the ability of calculation and reaction. So chess players have a very, very strong reaction ability, which mm -hmm. means like if you see a picture and there is something hidden, you immediately recognize it because we have to be very strong in reaction because sometimes we're playing very quick games. So if the move happens on the board, we have to percept quickly and yeah. react. But by the age, actually, this ability gets a lot slower, which means in moments when you have little time on the board, your reaction and your perception of the new situation yes. is much slower. And then you make worse moves or you plunder more. And this is one of the main reasons why in age, most, not there are exceptions, of course, most of the players become automatically weaker. So I never actually became stronger than my dad. It was rather my dad was becoming weaker. Weaker, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And um, I mean, um, Another question I've got is, within <coughs> the match or in the game, um, what is it like with your competitor? Is it actually like that you're playing some kind of mental psycho games <laughs> or trying to, I don't know, play tricks on, <coughs> on him or her? Or what is it like? 
Well, I mean, like in our level, we don't use tricks because we know that our opponent would obviously recognize any kind of cheap tricks. But <laughs> what we do is, especially in the beginning uh, phase of the game, because like you have to understand chess is uh, starting with the chess opening. Mm -hmm. And we can get from our opponents all kind of information. What opening is he playing? Is he playing Sicilian or the French defense or the Karakan? So we get all this information. And what we do before the game is we prepare against the different variations okay. he's playing. Sometimes we try to even find novelties or new moves or surprising moves. And in the moment you're playing the surprising move, you try to see something in your opponent. Okay. There are those who have a poker face and you see nothing. And there are those where you feel he's feeling or she's feeling not convenient with the choice of line I'm choosing. Yeah. And How do you feel it? Like, what are the kind of signs? I can't even tell you what are the signs about. I look at my opponent and I, I sense it. I intuitively okay. sense it, but I cannot give you like any examples. Actually. Yeah. And on the um, <coughs> other side, do you train on having a poker face? <laughs> or No, you don't train it. You train it automatically over okay. the years when you're playing important events. OK. <coughs> yeah. So um, in general, do you try to keep eye contact or do you rather, uh, I don't know, look into other directions? Actually, it's considered to be unfair sporty when you face or when you stare at your opponent while he's sinking or she's sinking. That's why like you have hardly any eye contact because at least uh, in my <laughs> mentality, like, I'm not trying to confuse or irritate yes. my opponent because I think it's unfair. Yeah, definitely. Okay, but that's really straightforward. Um, have we got any questions by now? Yes, there's a question. Jana, we've got a question. Cool. Hello, nice to meet you. Um, I just wanted to know, there is a situation in the series, and I've uh, already asked this um, myself before, are you able to play a game in your mind like the two characters are doing on their driveway to New York? And second, how do you uh, yeah, improve your mental skills for playing chess? I mean, like acoustically, I didn't understand yeah. everything. This was a problem, like playing a game in your mind? I wanted to know if you, if you are able to play a game in your mind, like the ah. two characters are doing on the driveway to New York, and also how do you improve your own, uh, yeah, I don't know, mental skills to uh, to improve your chess play? Yeah. So I mean, like, you, you mean to like play? Like, for example, um, pawn d4, and then you can uh, conquer no, no, it I or understand, something like this? No, no, I understand. So the first question actually, like, um, is something very, very easy, and we do it all the time. So, for example, like, the funniest story I have for you, my dad used to be in the N NVA, like, in the GDR army. And while he was, like, uh, in his position and keeping everything under control, he was playing a blindfold game against one of the other soldiers using the chessboard. But he didn't need the chessboard. He just gave the notation, and we have everything in mind. So we are able, actually, to play a game without seeing the board. And I'm even able to play against four of you without seeing the board. All I need is the notation or the um, name of the move. And then, actually, I, I play it in my head. And it's like maybe for people like who are not professional chess players or chess players, something outstanding. But I can tell you this is something very easy for us. Because when you calculate variations, you are indirectly practicing this to move in your mind all this kind of different situations. So you're training blindfold chess. That's how we call it all the time. So it's something actually quite easy. Even so, in the movie, probably it was something very impressive. Yeah. And the mental state, um, what actually Beth Harmon did, she was using these kind of tracks to be able to imagine the pieces on the ceiling. Mm -hmm. But honestly, when you're using these kind of trucks, what she did, you're not even able to play chess because the thing is like that your calculation process will be dizzy. So basically, it means in order like, to keep your mental state more balanced, I doubt it is connected or the way of using these kind of trucks is helpful. Sometimes, for example, when you have a very crucial match, I can advise one class of wine which doesn't like interfere your calculation process, but it makes you calmer. But definitely not these trucks which were used by Bess Harmon. They used it to make it more dramatic, but you don't need any trucks to, rem to imagine kind of pieces on the ceiling and to play with these pieces. You don't need anything for that but being a chess player. 
But if you want to keep your mental state more calm, some actually use um, wine or some alcohol before the game. Nobody is making an alcohol test on you, so it's not considered to be like doping. But even like when I play very important tiebreak matches, sometimes when I'm too nervous, I have one glass of wine, but very little, just to keep myself more calm. And I know that it doesn't affect me in the calculation process because you have to calculate a lot. So a lot of alcohol or drugs are no good for that. Maybe I should have done that before talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your question. Any other questions? Yes. Oh, now we've got many questions. Jana, we'll keep you busy for a moment. Can you raise your hand or arm once again, please, so that she can see you? Thank you. What age uh, would you suggest uh, for children to start uh, playing chess and how would you start uh, to teach? <coughs> um, I started at the age of five, but I know some of my colleagues who started even at the age of two or three. I mean, ideally, I would say something between three and six is a good age to start. And at the beginning, it's very important, especially when you're working with girls. This is like a huge difference between working with like boys or girls, but if you're working with girls, keep like also the joy factor, like sometimes it can be purple pieces just to make it more appealing to the girl. But it's very important, especially when you work with young girls, to keep the joy and the aesthetic factor in mind to keep them um, basically interested in chess. Also, you should understand that the behavior of boys and girls is very different. With a girl, you are probably not able to work very, very long. With a boy, sometimes if he's very enthusiastic, as you maybe have experienced with your own kids, that your kid goes home, gets on the PC, and he doesn't move for six hours. You would never see this with a girl, but or like in a very seldom case it can happen, but I have never experienced any girl at the age of seven, eight, going home and sitting on the PC for six hours. And this is similar to chess in a way. If you're enthusiastic about chess, then in bo with boys it's probably possible, at least in the majority of cases, to work longer by concentration than with girls. But objectively speaking, the first 20 minutes they are there with you. After 20 minutes they want to play. So when you're working with very young kids, keep 20 minutes of knowledge and information to them and then let them play because they will not be able to take it more. Okay, that was really interesting. Cool, we've got another question here. And maybe before we pass on the microphone, what are your next goals? What is the next step for you in your chess career? Actually, like since we had a huge break of Corona in the first half a year, now everything is put into the uh, autumn and winter. Mm -hmm. So next week I play the European Club Cup. From there I go to the World Team Championship. From there I go to the Spanish League. And from there I go to the Grand Swiss. And from there I go to the uh, European Team Championship. So I have like five tournaments in a row, which are supposed to be over the whole year, yeah. and which are now in the last four months of the, of the year because of Corona. And this is going to be very tough. And since like, we have all contracts with the national team, because most of it are team events, you don't have a choice but to really bite through and try to survive. Okay, and um, five tournaments you said, how many of them are you going to win? Uh, well, actually, since there are team events mostly, it's not in my power to say that. It's like also my team members, but the German national team actually is um, in the world ranking among women, maybe number 11, 12. Okay. So the statistically chances to win anything is very, very low. Okay, <laughs> but you're still motivated to go. No, I'm motivated to go because I'm motivated to, first of all, like uh, present the first sport for, for my country, and second of all, also like to individually like uh, perform well. Of course, cool. Okay, now. Thank you. You said um, uh, drinking alcohol is no kind of doping in chess. Is there other things which will be doping or other ways to cheat? Actually, like we have got a list from the NADA about tablets we are not allowed to take. For example, like if you're a person who suffers allergies, then you cannot cross a certain number of cortisone in your system. Also, like some years ago, you couldn't drink more than three cups of coffee because a too high caffeine percentage was also considered as doping. But in any case, whatever we would take, we will not become better chess players. 
We're not, we are not running faster like in other sports, but we might be able to improve the ability of our brain staying fit and the concentration ability over a long period. But still, this doping is nothing compared to an athletics who takes something and is running faster, because in our case, we don't get better. Maybe we get a longer concentration ability, but objectively, nobody is even uh, taking any of these tablets because we know that it's not like a guarantee to win the games and because we lose or we win the game because we are the better players, but definitely not because we take the better trucks. Yeah, okay. Question answered? Okay. I think we're slowly running out of time, but Elizabeth, thank you so much for being here. It was really interesting and definitely one of my personal highlights. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you. <laughs>